Welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this webisode, we're going to talk about labor arbitration in the age of COVID. And in particular, I'm really thankful because somebody who I've been reading his work for a very long time and have really hold in very high esteem is Professor Rick Bales. <laughs> professor Bales is a professor of law at the University, Ohio Northern University Law. Um, and he also has been teaching and writing in employment and labor and ADR generally for many, many years. Um, he's very widely published, has many, many articles. Just Google it and you'll find them. Um, it's wonderful. He's also an arbitrator. So we get that standpoint, um, a labor arbitrator, and um, can fill us in on what's been happening in the labor arbitration space during the COVID pandemic. So Rick, first of all, just thanks for coming. Um, I know you're a busy person, so thank you for taking this time. I appreciate the opportunity, Amy. So I guess as we start off, I do wanna hear about sort of how things have been working in labor arbitration in particular, because we all know labor arbitration is really its own animal. Um, and, and I'm kind of wondering how it's been going with um, sort of COVID and how things have progressed. Well, when, when COVID hit and lockdown started, labor arbitration just came to a screeching halt. Um, labor arbitrators tend to skew demographically, to say the very least, on the older side. And, and not all are incredibly, or, or were incredibly technically proficient. And you know, lawyers generally tend to be a bit averse to change or to new technology. And so when COVID hit, everyone basically just called a timeout, put everything on ice, um, and postponed uh, all, all the, 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 the pending arbitration hearings uh, for a couple of months and in in, in hoping that you know, we'd get back to the days where we could do live hearings again. Then as it's become more apparent that that's not going to happen anytime soon, um, the National Academy of Arbitrators uh, got together with the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service and offered a really, really nice series of webinars on how to host an arbitration hearing. Um, and I think that, 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 that those webinars got people a lot more comfortable with the idea of, of online arbitration hearings. And so it, it, it certainly hasn't come roaring back. We're not uh, having nearly as many hearings as we were before, but I think slowly uh, people are, are, are becoming much more comfortable with the idea of doing arbitration hearings online and they become oh, more common. Do you have any kind of sense of what we're talking about in terms of numbers? For example, you know, how many online hearings you had sort of pre-pandemic versus during the pandemic or like in May versus today? So I've, I had zero uh, online before uh, pre-pandemic. Um, since the pandemic, I've had three hearings, I'd say three final hearings and several, what I'll, what I'll call kind of conference hearings or kind of mini hearings. Um, I don't know, I, it's hard to say, I, I don't have any big picture numbers. Um, the, the FMCS has not released any yet, at least that I know of. But my sense just from talking with other arbitrators anecdotally is that they're doing fewer hearings um, online than they were before COVID, uh, but, but there's picking up. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious then also, what is kind of the usual platform that most labor are? Zoom. It is almost exclusively Zoom. Um, and, and I think, now I, I'm not, Zoom is, is, is also the platform but that I am by far the most familiar with. But my, my understanding is that at least at, in the early stages of the, the pandemic, Zoom was either the only one that, uh, platform that will, would allow you to create breakout rooms, or it was, it was the one that, in which it was the easiest to do so and, and the most intuitive. And, and it's that breakout room functionality that's really important for any kind of a hearing or you know, for that matter a mediation as well right um, and so zoom almost immediately became the platform of choice uh, i know i know of a uh, of a handful of arbitrators who have used other platforms occasionally but i don't know any who who make it a practice to prefer a platform other than zoom so one of the really sort of interesting aspects, and, and I know you're also a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators, and you know, I read the opinion. I know um, that it is permissible to allow for an arbitrator to actually order an online hearing over a party's objection. But could you maybe speak to, number one, how often you think that's used, and then number two, sort of 
in what circumstances? Let me start first with, 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 with under what circumstances. Um, well, I mean, back up. So as an arbitrator, we, we'd always prefer to get an agreement of the parties, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's what I'll do. One of the, one of the, the, the nice things about uh, COVID and, and, and going online is that I always, uh, whereas before I'd walk into an arbitration hearing and, and just learn there what the dispute is about. Uh, now I, I always have a, at least two status conferences. I have a conference, uh, a Zoom conference with, uh, with the advocates as soon as they appoint me as the arbitrator uh, mm -hmm. to talk about scheduling, but also to talk about, do you want to do it online or do you want to do it in person? Um, and, and, and then that, that's kind of an opportunity to start talking things through. And then I have a second uh, uh, conference with them before the, the hearing on the merits to talk about Zoom logistics. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> I just got distracted. What was your question? So <laughs> Sorry, I, I went off on a tangent. Well, no, I think I, I like that though, because that's interesting because it sort of shows how it could even facilitate maybe settlement or something because you have more interaction. Actually, and it has. Uh, okay. Again, completely anecdotally, but I, should, I think that just the, 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 the process of bringing the, the, the parties together to talk about the logistics of a Zoom hearing has make it far, sometimes they continue the conversation, right? I mean, they, yeah. they have to agree on a lot of things without me being there, right? So they have to talk about, are we gonna do it? You know, how are we gonna exchange documents? Um, how are we gonna share documents with the witnesses during, during the hearing? Uh, a, lot, a lot of little things like that, that once they start talking about those things, then often the conversation, you know, veers yeah. into, uh, hey, you know, I don't really don't want to do one of these Zoom hearings. <laughs> so right. what, do you, what do you say we settle this case? So the, the other question I had asked and the other thing that then sort of the segue, because of course that's fine if the parties are in agreement, but, but of course you are going to have your foot draggers, right? You're going to have your respondents or who, who the who are just going to delay and say, you know, I, I'm not going to agree to an online hearing because then that's a great way of delaying, right? So Right, exactly. Uh, so so I, I think that the circumstances under which I would and have ordered an online hearing over a party's objection is if it's already been delayed. Um, so you know, we, we've, already, we've already, we had a hearing date. We've you know, we, we tried once to, to, to set a, a new date farther in the future, hoping that we could do it in person. And it's, it's apparent that, that we can't. Um, and, and so we've already had a delay and there's gonna be prejudice to the other party or uh, if, if we continue to delay. So if, if it's a, a, uh, a discharge and uh, the employee is, is unemployed and without health insurance right now, um, then a delay is going to significantly prejudice the union. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if the employer is dragging its feet, then I'm much more likely to, uh, to, to order, order it. And I would think another piece to the puzzle would be that you'd want to be sure that both parties have access to technology and feel yes. sufficiently comfortable with it. Yes. And, and that's, that can often be a concern, especially on the union side where, you know, especially for low or moderate income employees, they may not have a laptop at home. Uh, they may not have a great internet connection. Uh, we've, I, I haven't had to deal with that yet, at least not directly. There's always been a workaround. You can use a cell phone on Zoom. It's not ideal, but you can do it. Um, some libraries, you know, public libraries are, are open um, and have computers available. So that, that can be an option. Um, but so far, it, it's worked out okay. So far, most of the time, the parties have, have at least in my experience, uh, the parties have been willing to work with each other on whether they're going to do it online and whether they're going to be uh, to do it in person. Yeah, so far, I, I haven't I haven't done any in person since lockdown. They've all been online. Oh wow! And, yeah, and um, you know, even though the parties, again, in my experience, have have come to the Zoom hearing with some trepidation, uh, it's been it's always been their first time to do it. Um, you know, they they I think they also understand the lawyers certainly understand that like it or not. Zoom conferences and hearings are, are going to be with us for this foreseeable future. And so you're going to have to learn it eventually. Might as well learn it now. Well, and I would also think there is the byproduct of, I mean, it saves people money and time, right? It does. So I think, right. And so I think the online hearings are actually going to continue even post pandemic. I, I agree. Um, I know, I know, I still know almost every party that I have spoken to still says that they would prefer to do it in person uh, if they could. Um, 
And I, I, so I think at least at this point, a lot of folks are going to go back to doing it in person if things were to miraculously get better very soon. But as, as we do a few of them, I, I know I am getting much, much more comfortable with it. I feel very comfortable running a hearing now, whereas even just six weeks ago, uh, I was a bit nervous every, you know, before I, before I, I, I did one. And I've had several parties, you know, after a hearing say, you know, that was a lot better than I thought it would be. Well, and, and then of course, when they look at their checkbooks and they have more money and they're, because yeah. they saved a bunch of money or especially- Because they're not paying me to travel. Right, and also for themselves, or let's say you have children at home or you have, I mean, there's a lot of different circumstances where the, just having to even go to an office downtown in what city you live in it could be, that's an expense even in and of itself, you know? Very true. Um, so there's those kind of byproducts. The question though, that does come up with online hearings is how is it gonna work, for example, when you're questioning witnesses and there might be documents involved or just kind of assuring that the security of the situation, right? So, I mean, I've heard the argument, well, how do we sort of prevent let's say I'm talking to Rick, but I don't know if there's another person in the room who's coaching him, right? So, you know, that kind of question about witnesses being injured, um, examined um, online. I mean, nothing's um, going to be perfect, right? There's not going to be foolproof. I mean, I suppose you could pick up the camera and, you know, ask the witness to scan the room. I've never done that. Uh, I, I trust the lawyers to, I mean, and I tell the lawyers this, right? I, I am counting on you to, to counsel your witnesses you know, here's, here's some of the things that I, I, I expect at the very least that you're going to be talking with them about, right? I mean, nobody else in the room, nobody texting them uh, or, or, or communicating with them, no documents in front of them that, that have not been introduced as evidence, that sort of thing. Um, and at least in, in the labor context, even if they are not, even if the parties are a bit antagonistic, they still have pretty long-term relationships. Oh. I think, I think it would be would be very bad form and, and would be very detrimental to the, the long-term relationship of the parties for someone mm -hmm. to, to try to pull a fast one like that. Oh, I'm a little bit more worried about recording uh, a yeah. hearing um, and, you know, whether somebody surreptitiously recording a Zoom hearing. I, I My preference is not to record the Zoom hearing at all, uh, although I will if the parties want to. Uh, if, I, if I do, I'll record it to my computer rather than to the cloud and then share it uh, yeah. directly with the advocates. Well, and in the settings, you can also stop other people from, you know, recording. Um, so that can help. So I guess they'd have to do some kind of a cell phone or something on the side. Right. Again, and, and, and that's, a little... you know, a, a lot of these problems are, are, are present even in a regular in-person mm -hmm. arbitration, oh, yeah, 100%. right? I mean, even an in-person, yeah. uh, you know, uh, people will, will, will bring a, a cell phone and, and hit the record button without anybody knowing it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, and then finally, I guess the last question is kind of your insights on um, overall, like if there were any tips that you wanted to give other labor arbitrators, especially dealing, you know, kind of your top five of things that you would really say, hey, here are like the top five lessons learned that you want to share with other labor arbitrators. Uh, number one, practice. Just, just practice with Zoom. Um, do plenty of, you know, before you have a formal hearing on the merits, do several conferences just to practice and, and, and get comfortable with the technology, get comfortable moving people back and forth and in, into and out of breakout rooms. Uh, you know, uh, practice making sure that, 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 uh, that, that you put people into the right rooms at the right time, right? With the, yeah. with the right other people. I have, I have made boo-boos that way myself. So that, that'd be number one. Um, Number two is I think having at least one and maybe two pre-hearing Zoom conferences to test the equipment and to get everyone's agreement as to how logistics will work is, is really important. Um, number three is <laughs> tell everyone that there are going to be glitches, right? I mean, just, just oh, yeah. really upfront. Look, I mean, <laughs> somebody is gonna get dropped probably several <laughs> times during, during this hearing. Um, here's what we're going to do if that happens, right? Um, I, I, I've already arranged so that I have the lawyer's, you know, cell numbers. They, uh, the, the lawyers have mine. If they get dropped, they can call me or I can call them if, if for some reason other forms of communication break down. Um, 
I, I instruct the lawyers, make sure you've got your witnesses and your clients, you know, cell numbers and vice versa. So that if the witness gets dropped, you can uh, communicate with that person and bring them back in. You know, when, when there, you know, there will be a glitch, when there is a glitch, we'll call a timeout, we'll back up a few steps, we'll figure out how to fix the problem, and then we'll, we'll start over again. And, but I think that, that setting the expectation that it's not going to be seamless, there are going to be, be issues, but we can deal with them and, um, is, is, is a good way, I don't know, to lower expectations a bit. And then when things actually go reasonably oh, yeah. well, people are real happy with it. <laughs> then they're like, wow, it was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the other thing, the, the only other piece of advice I would give is, uh, when you're online, especially in a hear in the context of a hearing, it helps to over explain what I'm about to do. People aren't all that comfortable with a, you know, with, with, with doing something formal like a hearing on Zoom. Uh, many people haven't used, you know, especially the witnesses, they may not have used Zoom very much at all. Um, they may not be familiar with, you know, how breakout rooms work. And so, before I do anything, I, I tell them, okay, so now you know, you've asked for a break. I'm more than happy to give a break. This is a good time for it. So uh, do you want to just everyone mute their microphones and their and their cameras, or do we want me to uh, put you into breakout rooms first? Okay, you want me to put you into breakout rooms? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put these people in this breakout room. I'm gonna put these people in this breakout room. Um, it's gonna take me a, a minute or two to, to make sure that I've got everybody going the right place. And then once you're in the breakout room, you know, we're going to take a 10 minute break. So at 635, uh, I'll bring you back in. I will send you a text message at about 634, giving you a one minute warning. And then uh, I'll, I'll close the breakout rooms and there'll be a clock that clicks down and gives you another minute. So, right, but I'm, I'm going to talk, anytime I, I'm going to do anything, I'm going to talk it through much more than I would if you were in a, an in-person hearing. And I think that that increases people's comfort level. Oh, yeah. No, 100%. In some ways, it kind of keeps you more um, on task than otherwise, right? Because you yeah. can't be as kind of flexible. You have to say, here's what we're going to do. And you're kind of, you know, it's pretty clear. So, I mean, there's, that's also probably a kind of a good thing for many reasons. Yeah. And I was just kind of sum up by saying, you know, I never would have said this six weeks ago. I, I actually prefer Zoom hearings to in-person hearings. Um, I, I, I'm bringing you over to the evil side. <laughs> You're a I, proponent I, of ODR. Woohoo! Yeah, I mean, I, I really like it. Um, it works well. It saves the, you know, the hassle and the cost of travel. Uh, but even, even more than that, um, I'm able to see people often better than I am in person. I'm able to, 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 to keep control over, over the hearing. Um, I don't know. I, I just I, I have, a, have a comfort level with it that I, I did not uh, several months ago. And, and I, having spoken to a lot of parties and other arbitrators, a, a lot of other folks are saying the same thing. I, I think that this technology is is with us to stay. I think it'll be one of many tools in our in our toolboxes. Um, but I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Well, on that note, um, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. And of course, it's a great note because as a proponent of ODR, it's nice to hear that we brought you over. So, so but I do think there are great benefits and, and what you've described are some really awesome tips. Um, I know I, for one, am going to re-listen to this um, webinar many times because this is really helpful information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, for the opportunity and for all the great work that you do on ODR. See ya. <laughs>